Give us your sense from a distance. I understand you're not in the negotiations, but what is separating the two sides, the UAW on the one hand and the big three automakers on the other? I would say roughly the something the size of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is really a scary situation. We've had many, many uh, labor negotiations between the auto workers and the UAW over the decades. We've had some strikes, unfortunately, but some of them uh, probably were inevitable or even perhaps necessary. This situation is really scary for a, a number of reasons. First, you have a very, very activist uh, UA, new UAW leader who I do not know personally, but who has said you know, very, very inflammatory things, uh, didn't do the traditional GM uh, or auto worker initial uh, um, handshake, which you know is just symbolic. He doesn't have to do that. But has based it, but more importantly, has put out a set of demands publicly, which is unusual in itself, that are an utter laundry list uh, from everything from a 32 hour week to a four hour week to more holidays to more job restrictions to a re restoration defined benefit uh, pension, uh, pension, pensions, just a long, long list of stuff that is just beyond the pale in terms of uh, any auto company's ability to meet it. Now, one of the things that Sean Fain, and I guess his name of the head of the UAW, has said is they need to make up for some lost time. There has been a lot of inflation, as we know. They were operating under a labor contract that really didn't allow that inflation to be taken into account. Can you separate out what is truly making up for lost time, catching up with where they should be, maybe advancing a bit, as opposed to, opposed to fundamentally changing the business model for the auto companies? Well, I think that when you talk about asking for pay increases, and they've asked for very large pay increases as well, that sort of falls into the lost, uh, making up for the lost time category. Although I would acknowledge that, or I would note that they did get fairly substantial profit sharing bonuses as a result of the auto companies being more profitable. They have had wage increases and so on. So it's not like they took massive pay cuts uh, in recent years during this inflationary period. But, uh, but the bigger thing of concern to me uh, is everything around the actual pay level. And it includes it includes things like the, the number of hours worked, when overtime kicks in, how many holidays you get, how many personal days off you get, things like that. But but here's David, the thing that is the scariest of all to me, which is work roles. Uh, I am a great believer in unions. I'm a great believer in the right and the ability of unions to bargain for higher compensation and for certain kinds of other benefits, healthcare things like that, that we all know are important now for workers to have. But when you start talking about work rules, uh, then you start cutting into productivity. And then we start going down a, a slippery slope we've been down before with bad effects. When we got involved with the auto sector, uh, and in General Motors in particular, I remember, there were something like 300 job classifications at General Motors. If you were an electrician, you couldn't touch a piece, uh, a piece of plumbing. Uh, if you were a, a, a truck guy, you couldn't you couldn't do something else, and so on and so forth. And it makes for a highly inefficient production process and works to the detriment ultimately of everybody. And the unions have come back now and asked for the reinstitution of some, happily not all, of the kinds of work rules that we had before 2009. And that kind of rolling back of this, this, this sort of wholesale rolling back of the clock is a very dangerous thing. Uh, place to be. So, but let me say one other thing. You, you ha in terms of all of these wage settlements and negotiations that you see going on, whether it's UPS, whether it's the auto industry, whether it's whatever, you, you have to really separate in a way, I know this doesn't sound necessarily completely fair, but you have to separate the so-called tradable sectors from the untradable, non-tradable sectors like services. Paying the UPS workers more absolutely contributes to inflation. Uh, it, it, it affects every American who ships something by UPS and obviously benefits the UPS workers. Uh, doing, a, doing something similar in a tradable sector, by which we generally mean goods that can be traded across borders, you do run into international competitive issues. If we, and this was part of what ailed the industry back in 2009, if you, the yin and the yang of this is if you raise wages too much, then production will flow somewhere else, most notably in Mexico, which has had a disproportionate share of production increases in the last 15 years, or uh, it will flow from the north, from the unionized plants in the north to the non-unionized plants in the south that are operated by a lot of the foreign companies that are coming here. And that does save jobs in America, but they're much less remunerative jobs. Uh, and they're located in 
places in the country that perhaps don't even need the jobs as much. So it, there's a lot of complexities to what to, to, to what is a, a fair and appropriate level of wages once you start getting into these tradable sectors. Uh, Steve, as you lay out, there's a dynamic in this negotiation, a lot of concern about whether they can actually bridge the gap. But this all comes against a backdrop of uh, larger changes afoot in the electric vehicles. And that's showing up, as I understand it, already in some of, for example, the battery plants with some joint ventures, where I think the UAW is saying, wait a second, they should all be subject to UAW as well. How big a problem is that as the auto industry looks, both workers and employers, look forward to a very different world with electric vehicles? Yeah, that's definitely a complicating factor. Electric uh, car plants, electric cars in general, require many few man hours of labor to make, as I'm sure you know, uh, fewer moving parts and so forth. And so in the long run, it does raise the question of the of level and extent of auto jobs that we're going to need in this country or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, it, it's not all going to be done by robots, don't get me wrong, but, but is there going to be some cap or some uh, lessening of the number of jobs we need? And then you have these new, and I think just speaking particularly of Ford, which has these joint venture battery plants, uh, should they be unionized or not be unionized? And again, I would come back to the same sort of set of trade-offs that if you if you unionize them, if you impose the same kinds of restrictions, requirements, and so forth on those plants that we do on traditional assembly plants, then a lot of those jobs may not end up coming here. Whatever number of jobs there are in the electric battery area, some of them will not come here because it'll just become too expensive to make the stuff here. So there's got to be compromise on both sides. We have to find a happy medium. But my my you know my strong encouragement to the union side of the equation is to focus on pay and benefits. I think those are really important for union workers, for all workers, and not uh, and not create impediments to management being able to manage those plants as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Steve, you're a banker and an investor. You're not a labor negotiator that I'm aware of, at least. But from an outside position, how do you see a way forward for essentially for the UAW maybe to climb down off of some of those demands, perhaps the auto workers to come up forward? And also, by the way, what role does President Biden and the administration play in this? Because President Biden has said he's very proud of being very pro-union. Yeah, I, as I said earlier, I think this is going to be, I, I don't know exactly how this is going to end, because I think this is a tough one. On these negotiations are traditionally held with a good bit more secrecy than is surrounding this one. And Sean Fain has put himself way out there, and it is going to be difficult for him uh, to uh, climb down from that with his membership. He's been out touring plants and and fighting, you know, fighting, uh, cheering on with the fight songs and all the rest of that stuff. And it's going to be it's going to be complicated. And he's conducted this much more in public than has traditionally been the case. Uh, I, I understand where the president's coming from. He's very strongly pro-union. I'd like to think I'm pro-union too, but I think the president's got to be careful here because if he, uh, in a way, encourages the unions to create even more demands that are simply impossible for the car companies to meet, then this is going to end very badly. I would say I think the handicapping around the industry that I hear at the moment is that this is certainly the most... Uh, the highest likelihood of a strike in a number of years, and probably north of 50 percent somewhere that will have a, a strike out of all of us. And one further point, at least I am asking about that, is how big a strike? I mean, when I was a boy in Flint, Michigan, and my dad worked at AC Spark Plug, there were strikes. But typically, my recollection was the UAW would go after one auto company, get a deal, and then go to the other auto companies. Sean Fain is talking about doing all three at once. Is that plausible? It's, it's, it's certainly plausible and also scary. Yes, I, I have seen all that, uh, and everything you say about the history is correct. Typically, or traditionally, they've struck one, picked one target and struck that one. Um, but yes, Sean Fain is talking about uh, striking all three of them. 